Pacific roller breaks on the shores of the Galapagos. The islands lie on the equator, but a complex system of ocean currents makes the water comparatively cold here, cold enough to suit even fur seals and sea lions, unless something goes wrong with those currents. In 1982, things went badly wrong. That was the year when El Nino went wild. Both fur seals and sea lions normally live in temperate rather than tropical seas. However, there's little doubt how they both got here. Thousands of years ago, the sea lions came south on the currents from California, found no competition, and colonized some of the islands. Today, they breed throughout the archipelago. There are at least 20,000 of them. Some say as many as 40,000. They're slightly smaller than their Californian ancestors and, like much else in the Galapagos, are placed in a separate subspecies. They've more heat tolerance than fur seals, so tend to frequent beaches with some open sand where there's less shade. The fur seals reach the Galapagos from the opposite direction, the south, encouraged, no doubt, by the northward flow of the cold Peru current up the west coast of South America. They're the only tropical example of a sub-Antarctic genus and are given the status of an entirely separate species. Their nearest relatives are in Peru. There's seldom any clash between sea lions and fur seals. Fur seals require a lot more shade and prefer rocky coastlines for that reason. You can tell them from sea lions by their stockier build and more pointed snouts. Like sea lions, they have external ears and hind flippers that can be turned forward and used somewhat like feet. In the early 1900s, fur seals were hunted nearly out of existence for their thick underfur. Hunting stopped when it became no longer commercially worthwhile. Recovery of the species started in the 1930s. Today, with complete protection, the population is between 30 and 40,000. However, it can easily crash due to natural disasters, and that is what happened in 1982. Every year, from September until May, a mass of warm water moves south in the Pacific, displacing much of the food-rich colder water around the Galapagos. It's called El Nino, named after the Christ child. It often starts around Christmas. At unpredictable intervals, El Nino flows with exceptional force and volume. It did so in 1982, upsetting the weather over most of the southern hemisphere and taking the plankton swarms and fish away from the Galapagos. All marine life suffered heavily. For months on end, the islands were covered with cloud. Very little rain falls each year on the lowland areas, but in the El Nino year of 1982, rainfall was truly tropical. Many seabirds failed to nest, but El Nino's impact was most obvious along the shoreline. In normal times, marine iguanas are almost as plentiful as the lava on which they bask. In the year that El Nino struck, the iguanas hardly bred and corpses littered the shoreline. The sea lions were equally badly hit. Almost all the pups born in 1982 died because their mothers couldn't find enough fish so they didn't produce the milk to support their young. The fur seals fared even worse. They usually breed when upwellings of nutriment from the seabed attract great shoals of small fish and squid. When the warm waters of El Nino took over, the cold upwellings failed, and the fur seals and sea lions found themselves searching for food in a marine desert. 
Fur seals feed mainly at night when cold water prey species rise from the depths towards the surface. El Nino warmed the upper layer of the sea so that this nightly vertical migration of prey never took place. The fur seals searched far and wide, burning up energy and finding little food to replenish it. The El Nino disaster finally ended in July 1983. But that year, few of the surviving females gave birth and the pups were small and stunted. Nevertheless, the stage was set for recovery. Practically all the big territorial males, the beach masters, had been wiped out. Smaller bulls found themselves fighting for huge territories. The largest surviving males established themselves in fights like this over territories four or five times their normal size. Often they didn't manage to evict rivals as the bigger bulls would have done. They simply tried to chase them away. They still got fight scars in the process. With fur seals, as with everything else, nature, given the chance, has a way of reasserting herself. The next season, 1984, was an unusually cold one. The currents brought plenty of food. The smaller males had grown tremendously to become heavyweights like this bull. They were now able to hold their territories and their females. In normal years, only half the cows produced pups. During the El Nino year, all the females had lost young. The surviving cows were thus starting to breed again, all together. The new young beach masters were firmly in charge of their harems, and the breeding system, evolved over thousands of years, was working once again. In 1984, there was not only an abundance of food, but fewer mouths to be fed. So there was an exceptional number of healthy pups that year. Females were almost 20% heavier than in previous years. A team led by Dr. Fritz Trilmick of the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior has been studying Galapagos fur seals for some years now. They were therefore able to record the disaster that overtook the fur seal colonies during the exceptional El Nino year. In 1985, Dr. Trilmick's team was back on the still active volcanic island of Fernandina, monitoring the after effects of the disaster. If you want to weigh a fur seal pup or yearling, there is only one way to tackle the job, net the animal before it can reach the water. The results were surprising. Pups born in 1984 had grown to be exceptionally large yearlings, weighing as much as a normal two-year-old. This is a typical fur seal beach. 
Being a non-migratory species, fur seals spend up to 30% of their lives out of the water, and they have quite a problem regulating their thermal systems. Boulders and lava caves provide shelter from the equatorial sun, but they don't make it any easier for scientists who aim to chase and net the seals for research purposes. El Niños occur about once in every seven years, though they're rarely as severe as the warm water surge of 1982. This reached halfway across the Pacific, creating weather disturbances that caused droughts in Australia and southern Africa and floods in Ecuador, let alone what El Niño did on a comparatively minor scale to the Galapagos. As far as the fur seals are concerned, Dr. Trilmick concludes that El Nino years strongly reduce the seal carrying capacity of the Galapagos. Maybe that El Ninos have a positive effect in maintaining fur seal and sea lion populations at much lower levels than those of the colder regions which the two species normally frequent. So in a way, it's a price the fur seals and sea lions pay for living on the equator. Sad as they are, these crashes are a natural regulator of both species. El Nino hit the sea lions of the Galapagos almost as hard as the fur seals. All pups born in 1982 died. Pup production in 1983, the year the disaster ended, was about one third of the usual. But by 1984, everything was almost back to normal. Though they need shade for their pups, the adults, much more than the fur seals, are content to sunbathe with occasional cool-off periods floating in the shallows. Galapagos sea lions are probably the most playful animals in the world. Perhaps because they were not hunted like the fur seals, they're also the most trusting where man is concerned. A year after the end of the worst El Nino in memory, the sea lions were breeding as if to make up for lost time, or anyway for lost numbers. Pups abounded everywhere. Young are born throughout the year, except for the months of April and May. But the peak time for births is from August until October. Mockingbirds attend every delivery to feed on the placenta. Nothing goes to waste in these barren islands. With the return of normal breeding conditions, the bulls took up their non-stop battle for territories. As with the fur seals, many of the mature adults had perished with the food shortages brought by El Nino. So these were mainly young males moving up in the hierarchy. Lion mothers normally only produce one pup. On Española Island in 1984, survival's cameras filmed an event unique in sea lion biology recorded to date, a cow giving birth to twins. The probability was that the superabundance of food following the El Nino famine had acted rather like a fertility drug. Oh, <laughs> 
The Beachmasters hold their territory for two weeks at the most, so challenges are continuous throughout the breeding season. There's a great deal of interaction between a sea lion mother and her newborn pup, or in this case, pups. Chin rubbing and nosing strengthens the bond between them, with pauses for discouraging the inevitable mockingbirds. These are Espanola mockingbirds, an especially inquisitive and annoying subspecies. Voice plays an important part in establishing the bond between mother and infants. The pups bleat like lambs, and the mother responds with a deeper call. When there are many pups on a breeding beach, both mother and young largely rely on these calls to find each other amid the throng. This is vital when the mother returns after a feeding spell at sea. At first, mothers stay with their young most of the day and throughout the night. Unlike fur seals, sea lions are daylight feeders. Pups are continually hauled around by the scruff of the neck and forcibly groomed. Sometimes the very small pups have to be encouraged to feed. Within a few hours of birth, mothers take their young down to meet the sea for the first time. Provided food is plentiful, sea lions sometimes nurse their pups for over a year. In the glut year of 1984, the seas were particularly generous, so it wasn't uncommon to find a yearling competing with a newborn youngster for their mother's milk. The mother plainly decided who was to have priority, no doubt partly because the yearling's well-developed teeth were extremely painful. The story of the fur seals and sea lions in the year of El Nino is an amazing one. How their populations crashed in 1982 and came back so dramatically two years later 
is a marvellous illustration of the checks and balances that often operate in nature, when left to solve its own problems. Such recoveries can only happen where natural forces alone are at work and where man isn't applying additional pressures. Fortunately, the marine mammals of the Galapagos are totally protected. No one hunts the fur seals these days. No developer has yet had a chance to build marinas or luxury hotels on sea lion breeding beaches, though it could still happen. The government of Ecuador guards the treasures of the Galapagos well, while allowing visitors from the rest of the world ample chance to view them. Of these treasures, the sight of sea lions surfing off the island of Española must be one of the brightest jewels in the Galapagos crown, a jewel which even El Nino failed to dim. Mm-hmm. <laughs>